I like to think of ISO as a tool for allowing your camera to see in the dark. Sometimes there are occasions where light fades and the usual methods of letting light into your camera just aren't practical. Having this third option available to us has really helped me out in my hour of need. If you remember those days where you would go and buy a roll of film, the boxes would have different numbers on the side. For example, 100, 200, 400 and so on. Those numbers refer to film speed. This means the film would react quicker to light. The faster the film, a higher number, the more sensitive the film was to light. When using most modern day SLR cameras, of course there is no film. This has been replaced with a sensor. The same principles still apply. We can increase the sensitivity of our camera's sensor to light in increments by using these different ISO settings. Most SLR cameras will start with the lowest ISO speed of 100. This is great for shooting outside on a sunny day where plenty of light is available. From there, every increase in ISO doubles the sensitivity to light. So the next step up from 100 would be 200. This could help if you were still outside but now taking photos in the shade. From 200, we go to 400, so we double the sensitivity again. The higher you take your ISO number, the faster your sensor is to react to low light conditions. Faster film speeds used to create something called grain. These days, when shooting digitally, this is called noise. If you shoot at a high ISO and you zoom into your photos, you start to identify noise in the form of little colored pixels, especially in the darker parts of your image. Our camera's ISO abilities are becoming more and more advanced, allowing us to shoot with a higher ISO without noticing too much noise. But as a rule of thumb, I would try to keep your ISO at the slowest speed that you can to prevent any of that unwanted noise. In this example, I have made no changes to my shutter speed or aperture. My first shot is at ISO 100, and as we can see, the image is pretty dark. In this next shot, I've changed nothing but my ISO now to 200 and we can start to identify our subject, but it's still way too dark. Moving now to 400, we're getting there. With every increase in ISO, I am doubling the camera's sensitivity to light without changing any other settings. This is why I like to think of it as seeing in the dark. Now we know that a high ISO allows you to achieve a brighter image in lower light, it can also mean we can avoid dark underexposed images and use higher shutter speeds to avoid motion blur. If you shoot a moving subject and you want to avoid a slow shutter speed, we need some help from the ISO. Instead of your shutter opening for longer to allow light in, we can increase our ISO and this allows us to keep a faster shutter speed and capture a sharp image. Try to remember that ISO does not cope very well in very dark nighttime scenes, so try to avoid using high ISOs at night and choose a long exposure using a slow shutter speed and a tripod instead. Now that you have an understanding of the three elements that make an exposure, it's time to learn how they all work together and what effect they have on each other. This is called the exposure triangle. This is where shutter speed aperture and ISO all work together to create your final exposure. Each of these three coloured lines represent light and how it enters the camera to create an exposure. Depending on the shot you wish to create, these lines will stretch or shorten depending on which source the camera is using to gather light and where it needs to compensate. First let's take an example from our aperture episode. To achieve the shallow depth of field in this image, I opened my aperture to 2.8, which also lets in a lot of light. To keep this effect, something else had to control the amount of light that was let into the camera, so the image was not too bright or overexposed. This was achieved by using a faster shutter speed and a low ISO to be sure only a little light entered the camera from both of these sources. This balance meant our shot was perfectly exposed. 
Another example is from our shutter speed episode at sunset. I knew I wanted to blur the water and because my camera was on a tripod, this meant my shutter could be open for a longer amount of time to allow the motion to be captured. I therefore reduced my ISO to the lowest setting and shut down my aperture to a smaller hole, which would only let a small amount of light into the camera. Finally is the sunset shot from episode one. This scene took me by surprise as the light was fading and suddenly the sun broke through the clouds. Sadly, hiking at the top of the cliff meant that I didn't have my tripod with me, so I had to hand hold the camera. I used the slowest shutter speed that I could without a tripod. I also used an aperture of f14 because I needed the edge of the cliff in front of me to be in focus, just as much as the waves in the distance, so I couldn't gather light from there. With these settings, my image was still too dark, so I had to call on my ISO for some help to make my exposure brighter. The downside is that I had to suffer a little bit of noise, but it was more important to me to capture that scene and suffer the noise than to miss it altogether. The essential point here is that you almost need to make a decision before you take the shot as to what is the most important feature within your photo. Do you need a fast shutter speed because you're hand holding or photographing something moving? If so, you'll need light from either the aperture or ISO, or possibly both. Are you shooting somewhere inside with very little available light and you have opened your aperture as wide as you can, your shutter cannot go any lower, but it's still too dark. Then we need to up our ISO. As long as you understand that shutter, aperture and ISO all affect one another, you'll soon be on your way to learning what to do in different scenarios and by which means it's best to allow light into your camera. Every different type of light has its own colour. Whether it's artificial or natural light, cloudy or bright sunlight, they all take on different colours. White balance is how your camera compensates for those colour shifts that occur when shooting in different lighting conditions. One of the things that used to really confuse me when I was first starting to learn photography was why were my pictures looking so different to what I could see with my eyes? I didn't really know anything about colour balance. All I knew was that something that looked fine to my eye in front of me, colour-wise, suddenly came out either really cold or really warm, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. What's actually happening every day without us even realising is that our brain knows what white is, and so everything we see is already in perfect colour balance. However, it doesn't record or render in our photographs the same way. We almost need to tell the camera what it's seeing. It doesn't have its own brain like we do. So it's almost like we need to tell it what is white and what isn't. White balance refers to the colour temperature of a light source and is measured in units of degrees Kelvin. Forget the science for a minute. All you need to remember is that the colour of light will affect the colours in your photographs. Within your camera, there will be several different presets. The most common are the following. Auto, Daylight, Cloudy, Shade, Tungsten, Fluorescent, Flash, and Custom. The purpose of these presets is to counteract the color cast that you may see when shooting with a particular light source. Your camera doesn't know what environment or light conditions you are working in, so it can get a little confused. You can leave your camera set to auto, so that it will calculate the white balance for you. The problem in doing so is that the results can vary, and your camera could decide for you what colour it thinks your subject should be. With this example, the artificial light is rendered far too yellow, so we need to correct this by choosing the tungsten preset, which introduces more blue. Recently, I did a shoot for a friend of mine. She is a presenter and a voiceover artist, amongst other things, but she needed to update her portfolio. I'm a voiceover artist. Um, I started off my professional life working in TV, in natural history TV, making wildlife documentaries, which I absolutely loved. I did biology at university and found a route into TV work as a researcher and just found this like perfect fit of um, storytelling, which is something I love doing. 
You have to speak from the heart. I think that's the real essence of a good presenter, someone who is authentic and really genuinely cares about what it is they want to tell an audience about. For me, I thought it would be nice to photograph her in her hometown, just doing what she does day to day within her regular lifestyle. And one of those places that I chose for the first shots was the pub. <laughs> and it's a really cool pub. It's really old, it's nautical themed, and it's just beautiful. However, I had a slight problem with the color. Inside the pub, it's very warm and cozy and lovely and really, really nice. But the second that I introduced my friend into the scene, she looked really yellow and it just wasn't very flattering at all. It wasn't true to life as well. What I could see with my eyes wasn't necessarily the same as what was coming through the camera because the camera cannot render the colour. So what I had to do in that situation was just tell the camera, I'm shooting in a kind of warm environment here so help me out with a little bit of blue please. So I put it onto the tungsten preset. That introduces some blue because blue is the opposite to yellow on the colour wheel. Shot the pictures, they came out perfect. On the flip side to that could be a, like a bright sunny day and you think okay all well, my pictures are bound to look really beautiful and warm and sunny but if you move your subject into the shade they will actually look kind of blue because the colour of the temperature in the shade is so different to if you place them in the colour of the direct sunlight. So what we do then is we add just a little bit of warmth within the colour balance of the camera to correct from the other side. So you now bring cool back to warm. White balance isn't always used as a correction tool. You can really use it creatively to add atmosphere to your shots. Now, sometimes in the winter, I've stood on the edge of the beach in freezing cold, blasting wind and I'm trying to create something which is warm and sunny like it's the middle of July. How do we do that? Well, sometimes I have to trick my camera and tell it to create something that looks much warmer and sunnier than it actually is in real life. Light takes on different qualities even throughout one day. The colours at sunrise through to midday, late afternoon sun and sunset will all look really different but we don't really notice unless something dramatic is happening in the sky. There is a time called golden hour. This is the point just after sunrise and just before sunset where the sun is low in the sky and where it might be just coming up and it takes on a different kind of quality and a different colour. It is as it sounds. Everything just comes out a bit more golden. If I'm shooting natural light, I also like to photograph during this time, especially just before sunset and that sun is low and it gives off that kind of beautiful warm glow, you can really make somebody's skin tone jump and pop and look like they're beautiful and sun-kissed without having to use any artificial light sources at all. If there's an opportunity that presents itself, I just don't really think twice about what I'm doing. I just do anything to get the shot. I just thought, you know what, this has to be shot from the water side. So I decided to get in the water <laughs> and shoot back at my model on the beach amongst the rocks. The sun was just coming down and down and down. The waves were crashing, it was all getting crazy, but you do what you do to get the shots, especially when you're waiting on light. When the light comes right, you have to move. You have to, you never know how long it's gonna last. And it really did pay off because that beautiful light shining through onto her, illuminating her skin, making her eyes pop, it was just perfect. So now you know how to add atmosphere to your images or correct a colour cast in different light conditions. Next time you find yourself looking at your shots and feeling that something isn't right, try changing your white balance. You'll be amazed just how much impact colour can have on your final result.